My name is Tony Miano. I uh, am a member of Faith Community Church up in the Santa Cruz Valley. I'm here with other members of my church and friends to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. A chapter from the uh, book of Isaiah, written by the prophet Isaiah. And I would like you to ask yourself, while I'm reading this, who is this about? His name isn't mentioned here, but I want you to ask yourself, who is this about? It's Isaiah 53. God's word tells us this. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offering, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The word of God. So I ask you again, who was this about? Who was this chapter written over 700 years ago about? Who is written about in this chapter that even the Jews to this day will not teach this chapter in the Jewish schools out of fear that the students would come to know this man's name? Who is being talked about in this chapter? This chapter of prophecy, written over 700 years before the birth of the man that this was written about. The person that's talked about in this chapter should be obvious. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ the Lord. And both in Israel and in America, they will not teach this chapter from Isaiah the prophet, one of the most revered prophets among the Jewish people. They will not teach this chapter because they know who it's about. They raise their children, they raise their rabbis to deny this name, to deny the name of Jesus Christ. So fearful are they of the truth of the Hebrew scriptures that they will not teach Isaiah 53. Well, thanks be to God that we live in a country where I could stand on a stool and open the Word of God and declare to you the truth of God's Word. Isaiah 53 is about only one person, 
and that is Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. But make no mistake, my friends, there is only one Jesus. Although there are many Jesuses believed in today, there is only one Jesus. It is the Jesus that the prophets talked about. It is the Jesus who came to earth, God in the flesh, came in the person of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man and without sin. It is a Jesus testified to in Paul's letters. It is a Jesus that is testified to in the book of history in the New Testament, the book of Acts. It is the Jesus who will one day return as promised in John's revelation, the revelation to John. But yet there are many different Jesuses talked about in the world today. The Jehovah's Witnesses, and many times they'll come out here, the Jehovah's Witnesses would have you believe that Jesus is the incarnation of Michael the Archangel. My friends, that is a lie. Michael the Archangel is only mentioned about three times in the Word of God, and not once in association with Michael the Archangel. Jesus is not once associated with Michael the Archangel. So that is a lie, my friends. The Mormons would have you believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, that he is a created being, that they can one day be Lord of their world as they see Jesus Lord of this world. My friends, that is merely the imaginative delusion of a sinful teenage boy in the 1800s by the name of Joseph Smith. That Jesus does not exist. It is the figment of the imagination of millions of people around the world, including Mitt Romney. Yes, you understand that Mitt Romney believes that he will one day be the god of his own world? If he believes Mormon doctrine, that's what he believes. My friends, and I'm careful as I say this, the Jesus of the Bible, in some ways, is not the Jesus of the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Jesus in the Roman Catholic Church has to continue sacrificing for sin. He has to die and suffer every time a Mass is performed. The Roman Catholics do not believe that the work of Jesus Christ was finished on the cross. Nor do they believe that Jesus' work on the cross was sufficient for salvation. Because they teach that you must also do good works and be part of the Catholic Church in order to be saved. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible, the one true Jesus Christ, died on that cross, but he did not stay there. He did not remain in the tomb. He does not have to continue to sacrifice because all the previous sacrifices were somehow insufficient. No, Jesus Christ declared on the cross his last words, it is finished. Everything God required God to do to make payment, to make propitiation for your sin was completed when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And sin and death was ever defeated when he rose from the grave. He is not the Jesus of much of the American church. He did not have long flowing blonde hair. He did not have blue eyes. He was not a surfer who said, dude. He was no weak, namby, pamby. quiet, subdued, soft savior. No. Many churches will teach that, whether in word or in the way they behave. They talk about Jesus as their homeboy. They talk about Jesus as their boyfriend. These are all the imaginations of sinful people, and they blaspheme Jesus Christ when they talk that way. The Word of God says in Isaiah 53, again written more than 700 years before Jesus was born, that he was not a beautiful man. 
that he did not have a beautiful appearance. He was an Israelite. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. He was dark-skinned. He was rugged in his complexion. He was a carpenter by trade. His hands were not soft. They were calloused. They were hard. They were scarred from constant back-breaking work. His feet were filthy. His toes were not manicured. His feet were filthy from walking in the dirt and the mud day after day after day after day. And the Word of God declared that when he was beaten and when he was crucified, he could not even be recognized as human because his body was so ravaged and so mutilated and so bloody and so maimed. He could not be recognized as human. He was a lump of bloody, pulpit flesh. And he died on that cross. And he rose again. So it's very important before I start to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you know the Jesus that I'm talking about. It's the one of the Bible. It's the only one who died on the cross. The only one who rose from the grave. The only one who is God. My friends, the Jesus of Oprah is not the Jesus of the Bible. Oprah believes that there are many ways to heaven, my friends. That's a delusion. It's a Jesus that she's created in her own mind because like so many others, she loves her sin and does not want to submit to the one true God. So she creates one in her own imagination to suit herself. Now, Oprah is not the only one guilty of that. Millions and millions of people from every walk of life, and some of them standing in pulpits tomorrow morning, will create a Jesus in their own imagination to suit themselves. They'll create a Jesus who they say is all loving. That's not true. God is love. Jesus is love. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends. But God is not loving in separation of all of his other holy attributes. God is loving. Jesus is loving. He is merciful. He is kind. He is gracious. But he is also holy and righteous and just and a God of wrath. My friends, many people, maybe even some pastors, will declare to you this day that all of us are children of God. That is not true. Yes, we've all been created in the image of God, but we are not all children of God. The Word of God makes it clear that if you have not believed in the Son of God, if you do not obey the Son of God, you are not a child of God, but you are a child of wrath that the wrath of God abides on you. So let's be very clear who we're talking about today. Is Jesus Christ the Lord? He is the firstborn of all creation. That does not mean he was created. It means he is preeminent over all creation. He was with the Father at creation. He was with the Holy Spirit at creation. And the Word of God declares that all things, including you and me, are in subjection under His feet. Jesus Christ is Lord. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The question is this. Knowing that, where will you be in the next millisecond after you make that declaration? Because all of us will die one day. It's not a scare tactic. I can't scare anybody into heaven. But it's a reality of the world that we live in. Ten out of ten people die, my friends. Each of us have an appointed day, an appointed time when we will die. 
My hope is that each and every one of you live a long and happy and prosperous life. But the reality is, is that none of us are guaranteed our next breath. None of us are guaranteed our next breath, my friends. None of us are guaranteed to make it across the street. How tired do you think your bus driver is today? None of us are guaranteed another day. Some of you may have cancer and know it. Some of you may have cancer and not know it. Some of you may have a heart problem and know it. Some of you may have a heart attack today and die never knowing you had a problem. That's not a scare tactic. That is reality. That is reality. Many of you, I'm sure, heard of Junior Seau's death a couple days ago. Soon to be a Hall of Fame uh, linebacker, respected and beloved by his brothers on the field and by fans off the field. By all accounts, a man who had it together. Nobody knew that there were any problems in his life. And the whole world was stunned when he laid in his bed and put a bullet in his chest and killed himself a couple days ago. I was stunned. I was stunned. Everything I ever heard about this man was that he was one of the good guys. He had it all together. Yeah, he made his mistakes like the rest of us. But no one, even his closest friends, in a million years would dream that he would take his own life. My friends, 160,000 people die every day on this planet. Almost a quarter of a million people died in Haiti in one day in an earthquake. And they all had one thing in common. None of them planned to die in an earthquake that day. None of them. But the reality is, my friends, we are going to die one day, stand before God, and give an account for our life. He's not going to judge us by how we perceive ourselves in the mirror. He's going to judge us according to what he sees in his mirror of his law. And he has given us a summary of his law, my friends, in the Ten Commandments. One of his commandments is that we shall not lie. And who among us can say with a straight face that we've never told a lie? I know I can't. And men, and I'm speaking to you men, if you think you're off the hook because you lie to your wife or girlfriend about their dress and how they look, you are not. You might delude yourself to think that you were trying to spare her feelings, but the reality is you're trying to spare your own skin. You're trying to stay out of trouble. Your lie isn't one of grace. It's a lie of self-perseverance. The Word of God says that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Now that might sound over the top to you, but consider this. If I lie to a small child, it would be wrong. Stay safe, deputy. If I was to lie to a small child, it would be wrong. But that child cannot punish me. I'm a 48-year-old man. What is the child going to do to me? I go home and lie to my wife. I could end up sleeping on the couch. I go to work on Monday, lie to my boss. I could lose my job. Stand before a judge in a courtroom, lie to him. I could go to prison. What has changed? It's still just a lie. But what has changed is who the offense is against. God is infinitely holy and righteous and just. Therefore, any sin against him, no matter how small we've made it in our own mind, no matter how much we justify it in our own mind, is ultimately sinful to an ultimately holy God. That's why he is good and he is just when he says that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. My friends, if you have ever harbored bitterness or resentment towards someone, if you've ever been angry without cause, God doesn't simply see you as human. He sees you as a murderer. The Word of God says whoever hates his brother is a murderer. His standard is perfection, my friends. 
Look, if you want to get to heaven on your own, it is very simple. Listen carefully. I'm going to tell you how easy it is to get to heaven on your own. Simply live a perfect life from cradle to grave. Simply live a perfect life in thought, word, and deed from cradle to grave. How are you doing today? I can't remember how many times I have fallen short of that standard in thought, word, and deed. But yet that is the standard of Almighty God. Jesus said, you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And granted, none of us can live up to that standard. Sir, that was cowardice, young man. Sir, don't be a coward. Have more intelligence than your one finger. Come back here and talk. Don't be afraid. The Word of God says that all cowards will likewise have their part in the lake of fire. My friends, when you stand before God, you will not be raising one finger and blasphemy to Almighty God. You will be on your face begging for mercy. And unless you turn from your sin and put your trust in Christ, it is not mercy you will receive. No, my friends, God is holy and righteous and just. If you've sinned so much as one time, in thought, word, or deed, you fall short of God's holy standard of perfection. And because God is good, because he's holy and righteous and just, he must punish sin. And the punishment God has ascribed for sin is eternity in hell. And it doesn't matter whether you believe it, it only matters that it's true. And God's word is true. Back to Isaiah 53 for just a moment. This is so beautiful. What God did. What God did to save us from our sin. Absolutely beautiful. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. My friends, the reality is if we die and stand before God and we are found clothed only in our sin, we are going to spend eternity in hell. But thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 2,000 years ago, God the Father sent his Son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Fully God and fully man and without sin. Unlike you and me, he never once violated God's law. He could not. He was and he is God in the flesh. The sinless lamb, the sinless son of God. He lived a perfect life that we cannot live. And about 30 to 33 years into that earthly existence, he voluntarily went to the cross. Steve, I'm preaching. He voluntarily went to the cross. He suffered and died a horrible bloody death he did not deserve to take upon himself the punishment we rightly deserve for our sins against God. That's what I used. And then three days later, he forever defeated sin and death when he rose from the grave. He is alive today, my friends. Unlike every other false I'm god created by man, off. Jesus Christ, the one true God, is alive today. And he will return at a time of the Father's choosing. Do you understand what God did on that cross. It pleased God the Father to crush God the Son. It pleased God the Father to crush God the Son. Why? Did you say why, sir? John 3.16 tells us, in a nutshell, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is why God did that. And there is a beautiful picture of what God did through Christ and what Christ did for God the Father and for us. Thousands of years ago, in the life of the father of the nation of Israel, Abraham. You probably remember the story Maybe you heard it in Sunday school. Maybe you read about it in the Bible. There was a day when God Almighty commanded Abraham to take his son Isaac, who was the heir of the promise. 
to take him to a specific mountain and to sacrifice his son. Abraham obeyed. They went, they took a couple of servants with them. They went to the top of Mount Moriah. Isaac, who was going to be the sacrifice, carried the wood, just as Jesus carried the cross. Abraham had the instrument that would be used, the dagger. He put his son on the, on the, on the pyre, on the wood pyre, tied his son down. Like Jesus, the son of God, he did not fight, he did not scramble, he did not complain. He laid there knowing what was about to happen. Abraham raised the knife to kill his only son. And God stopped him. He said, Abraham, Abraham, stop. I know now that you believe. And God provided a ram caught in the thicket. And Abraham sacrificed that ram to the glory of God. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, he carried his own wood. He carried his own wood to that hill where he would be sacrificed. You can learn more about what you preach. Uh, you know what, sir? Don't be a coward. Come back here and talk about it. Really, don't be a coward. Come on back here. Okay. Come on back here. First off, did you know that Jesus never actually existed? That's a lie, sir, from the pit of hell. How do you know that? How do I know that? How do you know that Jesus didn't exist? That? How do you know? Because How do you know that? Because there was a man who the exact same story was exactly the same. He walked up water. You saw that on the internet, right, sir? I don't know why. No, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, you did. And, and sir, that's was, not true. And he was thousands of years older. Sir, that's what's Jesus. your name, by the way? I'm Tony. I'm Dave. Dave, nice to meet he you. Was thousands of years older than Jesus. His name was the Son God Ra. No, the sir. Son God. No, sir. The son of God. No, that's not true. It's all things to the world constellations. The twelve. No, it's not, sir. Sir, this is in your imagination. No, no, no. It is. It's no. not true. That it's is all in your imagination. Really? Have you read this? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I'm sorry. What's your name again? Dave. Dave. All right, Dave. Just so I know who it is that I'm dealing with, you said that you've read the Bible. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've read it for almost every day of my life for 23, 24 years. Dave, how many books are in the Bible? How many books? How many books are in the Bible, Dave? I haven't read it as many times as you have, but okay. my favorite no, 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 story. No, Dave, how many? My favorite story is the person who sows the oath. That's my favorite story in the Bible. That doesn't matter. Because that's really, David, really the only how many thing gospel? that matters inside David, of the Bible. David, how many Gospels are in the Bible? Let me tell you. Let me how ask many, you okay. something. My let friends, me ask you Dave is a good example. Who, who, Dave, you don't want to be no, no, let, let me go. ask you something. Sir, 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 okay, let me ask you it's something. Okay, who, who is Dave. David and Goliath? Who was Goliath? Dave. Ask yourself. That means a 12, Dave. 13 foot yeah. human you being. My... No, actually, it wasn't 12 to 13 foot. No, no, it's more likely 10. It's yeah. higher than that. You're Dave, right. do you have a point? I have a point. What is it? Hurry. You need to learn more about what you're preaching. because David, David, you're speaking out of... David, all right. David. David, David is David is one of the reasons why I'm out here. David is actually one of the reasons why I'm out here. I'm not angry with David. I don't hate David. I pity David. I'm out here to bring David the good news. That's why I'm here. I don't care what David thinks about me. I don't care at all what David thinks about me. What I care about is his soul. What I care about is where he's going to spend eternity. And my friends, David is angry with a book he's never read. He's angry with a God that he does not believe exists. My friends, that is not intelligence. That is foolishness. It is delusion. David is a God hater. But I love him. The word of God says to love your enemies. And I'm, I feel terrible for David, that he would not stand to hear the gospel. Ultimately, people like David are used by the enemy of God to thwart the preaching of the gospel. But his word never returns void, my friends. So I'm going to finish that story about Abraham. Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. God stopped his hand and provided a ram. But on that cross, when Jesus hung on that cross, God the Father looked at his son and did not hold back his hand, did not hold back the knife of the fury of his holy wrath. 
and he killed his son. And it pleased the father to crush his son so that sinners like us can be saved. Jesus said shortly before he went to the cross, greater love is no one than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends. But Jesus not only laid his life down for his friends, he laid his life down for his enemies. And before we came to repentance and faith in Christ, that's what we all are. We are enemies of God apart from Christ. And the wrath of God abides on us apart from Christ. Our only hope is if God adopts us to be his children. Amen. That is our only hope. I have two nieces, Jawatu and Ami, both from Liberia, adopted. And, um, and I have a nephew whose name is Jay. He's about seven, seven or eight years old now from Uganda. My, my sister and my brother-in-law, out of love in their heart for these children, went to Africa to adopt them. So I have a question for you about Jay. Jay, as an infant, was literally found by a police officer in a gutter of a dirt road. He picked Jay up out of the dirt. He took Jay and literally dropped Jay off on the steps of an orphanage. My sister and my brother-in-law saw a picture of Jay. They immediately fell in love with him and decided to make Jay their son. They went to Africa, they took Jay, adopted him, brought him back home to the United States. I have a question for you. How much of that was Jay's doing? How much did Jay have to do with his adoption? As, as a year or two old. Did Jay command the police officer to pick him up out of the dirt and take him to the orphanage? Did Jay command the orphanage to post his picture online with adoption agencies? Did Jay command my sister and brother-in-law to love him and choose to adopt him? Did Jay command my sister and brother-in-law to fly to Africa to pick him up and to bring him back to California? No. It wasn't on the basis of any deeds that Jay did. It was based entirely on the mercy and the love of my sister and my brother-in-law. What was you do? And the same, you hang on, sir. Hang on just a second. I'm going to explain. Please, thank you. you Who you adopting? Adopt me. I, I can't adopt you, sir. You're, we're about the same age. But Jesus Christ can. Hang tight. Let me get to the point. This is very important. Jay had no say in his adoption. None whatsoever. It wasn't because of the deeds that Jay had done in righteousness that my sister and brother-in-law decided to adopt Jay. It was based on their mercy. And the same is true for us. The same is true for salvation. No one is saved on the basis of deeds that they have done in righteousness. It is based entirely on God's mercy. It is because God chose to love us. We can only love God because he first loved us. No one comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. And Jesus said, I will raise him up again on the last day. When my sister and brother-in-law adopted my nephew, they gave him a new name, they gave him new clothes, and they gave him a new home. And those who turned from their sin and by faith and by faith alone receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior, they too will be adopted by God the Father as children. And he will give you a new name. It will no longer be a child of wrath. It will be child of God. It will no longer be condemned. It will be set free. It will no longer be death. It will be life. It will no longer be torture. It will be love. He will give you new clothes, my friend. He will give you new clothes. No longer will you be clothed in the filthy garments of your unrighteousness and sin. You will be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I have a kid. 
and you will have a new home. Your home will no longer be this place and then death. Your new home will be heaven. You will have a new home. You will have a future hope. You will have an eternal hope. A salvation set aside and secured by God alone for his glory. And the only way you can receive that gift is if you turn from your sin and by faith and by faith alone receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. He will take your heart of stone and he will give you a heart of flesh. You will begin to love the things that God loves. You will begin to hate the things that God hates. You will no longer presume upon his grace and mercy as if you deserve it. But instead, when you sin against him, you will run to him for forgiveness with the assurance that it is forgiveness you will receive. Because children of God receive the promises of God. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that promise, that gift, that forgiveness is reserved only for the born again follower of Jesus Christ. God has set the standard. God has set the terms and God does not negotiate. My friends, when you stand before God on the day of judgment, it will not be a court trial. It will not be the time when you get to plead your case, plead your righteousness before God. No, my friends, the day of judgment is a day of sentencing. It is a day when God will determine your sentence because you are like me, each and every one of us, are already guilty before God because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. My friends, the wages of sin is death. What we deserve for our sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So come to your senses. Stop worshiping the God of self. Stop worshiping the God of right self-righteousness. Stop, stop worshiping the God of atheism. My friends, atheism is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. It is not, it is not a system of intelligence. It is not a system of bright people. The Word of God declares that. The Word of God declares that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the atheist is the fool. Yes, sir. That's true, young man. Don't do a drive-by. Come back and talk. Don't be afraid. No one's going to hurt you. So my friends, come to your senses. Turn from your sin and by faith and by faith alone, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior while God has given you time. We have Bibles. They are free. We want nothing from you. If you have any reasonable questions, we would love to talk to you. We're not going to argue with you because we're not negotiating truth with you. We're not here to convince you that God exists. You already know that. You already know that God exists. He has written his existence, the reality of his existence on your heart. But if you don't believe, you're merely suppressing that truth in your unrighteousness because you love your sin. There's no need for me to argue with you about whether or not you believe God exists. You do. Whether you want to admit it or not, you do. I'm not going to argue with you about whether or not you're going to stand before God and be judged. You already know that. It's written on your heart. He's written his law in your heart. You know you will give an account. So we are not going to we are not going to engage in arguments with you so you can justify your unbelief at our expense. We're not going to do that. But if you're humble and you have a reasonable question, then you we want to talk to. And if you would like a Bible, we'd love to give you one. If you would simply like us to pray with you or for you about something, we would like to do that too. Thank I'm sorry, I can't hear you, young man. Speak up. Pray for what? Now, come over here. Pray for what? Physics? Come over here, young man. Come here, man. I need to pass my AP pass. Your AP? Where are you going? You running away? Young man, what do you think is going to happen to you when you die? Stop for a second and talk. You're going to what? <laughs> come on. Don't be, a goof don't be a goofy teenager. Come over here and talk, man. Don't claim to be intelligent. Stop and act intelligent. Come on. What are you afraid of? Everything. You're afraid of everything? I'm afraid of AP physics. Afraid of AP physics. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Folks, once again, please don't ride around in circles in your life like these foolish young men. Their, their God is the God of education. They, they worship at the throne of AP classes. Their parents, I'm sure, make them do that. They may even want to do that. But here's something, folks, you all need to remember. When was the last time you saw a hearse carrying a dead person pulling a U-Haul trailer? When was the last time you saw that? When was the last time you saw all of someone's worldly possessions being towed behind them in a U-Haul trailer? My friends, when you die, naked you came into this world, naked you will leave. You will not be able to take any of your gods with you, your gods of wealth and possession or relationships. You will not be able to take any of those gods with you. Naked you came into this world, naked you will leave. And naked you will stand before God to give an account. And your only hope is if you turn from your sin by faith and by faith alone, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior while God has given you time. Thank you for listening.